So I was trying to work on this hypothesis to increase a molecule that I knew was profoundly neuroprotective, able to stop any kind of seizure, not knowing that ketone-based metabolism is the foundation of a diet that does exactly that. Welcome back to Metabolic Mind, a nonprofit initiative of Bazooki Group, where we focus on the intersection of metabolic health and mental health and metabolic therapies like ketogenic therapies as treatment for mental illness. I'm Dr. Brett Scher. Today, we're continuing with a series of interviews we did at the 8th Global Symposium on Ketogenic Therapy, and today it's with Dr. Susan Messino. Now, I love reading her, her um, titles because she is a professor of neuroscience and psychology at Trinity College, and she's also the Charles Bullard Fellow in Forest Research at Harvard Medical School. That's a pretty cool combination, the neuroscience, psychology, and forest research. But So she's got sort of what she says is this dual life that she lives, um, but she's trying to bring them together to show how uh, forestry, nature, how all that is so important in mental health, but also the research she's doing about adenosine and what adenosine teaches us about ketogenic therapy. So she's she's a fascinating individual doing incredible work in this field. Uh, so I was really pleased to sit down with her uh, for this interview to talk about her work and talk about how this applies to potentially using ketogenic therapies um, to help people with mental illness and how nature fits into this whole puzzle. Now, but also please remember our channel is for informational purposes only. We're not providing individual or group medical or healthcare advice or establishing a doctor-patient relationship. Changing your lifestyle or medications uh, to treat certain medical conditions can be in, can be dangerous if done without proper supervision. So please consult with your healthcare provider first. Uh, but with that, I hope you enjoy this interview uh, with Dr. Susan Messino. Well, Dr. Susan Messino, thank you so much for joining me here at the Ketogenic Therapeutics Conference. Thank you for having me. It's so exciting to be here. Uh, you gave a great talk this morning that I want to get into some of the details about because I find it so fascinating. But briefly, just give us a brief background on who you are, where you are, and, and kind of why you're here as a speaker today. Uh, sure. So um, I'm a professor at Trinity College, and my official title is Professor of Applied Science. Um, my PhD is in biology, and I'm primarily a neuroscientist. And I actually got into the ketogenic diet as a research area via my work on adenosine as a molecule that's in, evolutionarily conserved and important for so many things. So I kind of am an unusual case in the ketogenic diet world because I came to this really through basic science. Yeah, I find that so interesting because people can come from different areas. And so your talk today, had quite a bit to do with adenosine, but also this concept of ketogenic diet as a therapy, which is what this whole conference is about, but how it's sort of multifaceted or multimodality, which as you said, doesn't fit the single lock and key approach that we do so often with, with drugs. Like here's this one mechanism, this one problem, let's address it with this one intervention, but the concept of ketosis is different. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, um, you know, this is something that has been an evolution in my scientific thinking as well, because when I started working in this area, everyone's question was, what is the mechanism? Yeah. And um, I think both from my perspective as a systems neuroscientist and my work on adenosine, I know that there's so many different things that, that can be going on, and I kind of think of the ketogenic diet as a whole box of puzzle pieces, and you don't know which puzzle pieces are gonna be critical for addressing different conditions. And so it's actually, I think, super powerful to have such a pleiotropic, you know, multi-mechanismed therapy that's not toxic, right? So it's just a matter of, you know, do you have the right puzzle pieces and the right size puzzle pieces to address the things that are going awry? Yeah. And from a patient perspective, right, the patient doesn't care why it, why it works as long exactly. as it works, right? But from a maybe from a clinician or certainly a researcher perspective, a lot of them were, would be very dissatisfied with that. So how do you as a researcher try and like bridge that gap between the research not being completely clear on the mechanism like and boiling it down to what's important for the patient? Well, you know, that's an interesting question. I almost feel like I have the best of both worlds because... I feel like I'm able to take that holistic point of view and not get unsettled by it. But at the same time, um, I think my work on adenosine has provided a really key mechanism in how the ketogenic diet can work because adenosine is involved in energy, which is critical for everything. It's involved in signaling and neuronal activity, which is critical for addressing epilepsy and many conditions which are 
characterized by abnormal activity. And it's also involved in epigenetic changes. So if you want to reverse disease or cure disease, you know, kind of unravel dysfunction, you need to promote some long-term changes. So just that one mechanism itself has multiple, multiple opportunities. Well, then how do you connect ketosis with adenosine? What's the connection there? Well, uh, this is how, this is sort of my backstory of how I came to it through my basic science is I was really interested in trying to understand how adenosine is regulated. Because adenosine um, is neuroprotective, it stops seizures, it's kind of regulating neuronal activity all the time, but you can't give adenosine as a therapeutic molecule because it'll stop your heart. And that's considered an unacceptable side effect in drug development. So yeah, I was looking at how could adenosine be regulated in the brain and through a bunch of work on um, kind of physiological conditions that altered adenosine, changes in temperature, changes in pH, oxidative stress, a whole bunch of experiments that I did using kind of physiological manipulations, um, I came upon an idea that uh, ketone-based metabolism could increase adenosine. And I didn't know that there was a ketogenic diet. So I was trying to work on this hypothesis to increase a molecule that I knew was profoundly neuroprotective, able to stop any kind of seizure, not knowing that ketone-based metabolism is the foundation of a diet that does exactly that. So that's how I got into it. It has been a very, very exciting, you know, opportunity as a scientist. Right. Yeah, it's so interesting that you can't give ke adenosine as a drug, but you can give things that can maybe improve the endogenous adenosine that already exists yes. and, and the function of it. And then that could be a mechanism. But again, not the one and only mechanism, but a mechanism. Exactly. So yeah, I like how you tied that together, that you have the best of both worlds because you came from a mechanistic standpoint, but you still understand the, the pleiotropic effects of yes, it. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So another part of your talk, which I found fascinating, was the preconditioning for a stroke or to, well, I, I can't describe it as well as you can. So tell us about that because I found that so interesting. Yeah, I, I tried to kind of introduce that concept at this meeting to try and talk about how adenosine or ketone-based metabolism can be kind of like a platform for better resilience and, and health. And that's um, kind of the foundation for a phenomenon called preconditioning where um, if there is an insult that's a minor insult, having that happen could then be protective against a subsequent bigger insult like a stroke or some kind of tragic thing. You'd be protected from that by this prior insult. And um, the interesting thing is you could have a change in temperature that would then protect you from a stroke. Or you could have a metabolic poison, slight dose of a metabolic poison that would then precondition you and protect you from a subsequent insult. So there's almost cross uh, pollination, cross you know support in this general preconditioning mechanism. And adenosine is pivotal in preconditioning. That's one of the essential mechanisms in preconditioning. And there have been recent papers that have started to come out about ketogenic diet also being something that can help with preconditioning, both with preserving behavioral and motor function and also reducing the size of the area affected by the stroke um, and showing that adenosine was critical to that preconditioning caused by a ketogenic diet. So I almost think if you get your system kind of preconditioned like this, you're able to withstand any, almost any kind of insult that might happen. And that's kind of a really powerful thing to think about in promoting and curating your own brain health and resilience. Right, and that really frames the discussion instead of a treatment reacting to something that's happened, but almost like a prevention. Exactly. To use it, yeah, preemptively to protect. Yeah, and I think that's so important. Yeah, and that's really, you know, how I've started thinking about my work. I know that most funding is for disease, but the reason why I really started to get focused on brain health is the better brain health you have, the less vulnerable you'll be to disease or the slower the progression would be to the disease or perhaps you can prevent it entirely or reverse it. Yeah. But again, it comes down to how does that filter to the clinicians and then to the patients as something that, yes, we should try. Yes, something is going to be beneficial and yes, is safe. So 
Where do you think we are in that spectrum? What's it going to take to get to that level where it's more widely accepted? Well, I've been thinking about for a long time how to make um, low carbohydrate, ketogenic approaches and um, this idea about brain health more real community based as a tool in the toolbox for people who care about their brain health, which is hopefully everybody. Um, and how to how to make it more accessible to people literally in their communities. And um, so I have some ideas about that that I want to kind of explore. And, you know, maybe that will be a way to make it more accessible for people who are open minded about trying it. Because I think if we relegate this to people who are then at the doctor to have a serious problem that needs to be unraveled, right? It's, it's just a limited number of, of people that have access and or have a terrible condition, right? We want everybody to have better brain health. And I think we need to get it more widespread, teach people how to do this in communities and, you know, just make it a lot more accessible. Right, right. Yeah, I think that was, that's a really good discussion about ketosis, its relationship to adenosine, the, the mechanisms we know and the many mechanisms that, that also can occur and then how to get that information out there. But then transition to something seemingly very different, but actually related. You talked about your double life, so to speak. Oh, you, yes. <laughs> yes. That not only are you a scientist doing all this research, but you're also very involved in, in the environment and forests and trees and the, the impact that can have on mental health. So tell us a little bit about that and the, the connection there. Yeah. So in my kind of quest of what are the tools in the toolbox to promote brain health, um, and I know from being a college professor, spending time in nature is so important to my students. It was so important to me growing up. There's been so much research coming out on that. And um, I did a fellowship at Harvard a few years ago that was joint between Harvard Forest and Harvard Medical School, trying to look at what's the quantified evidence for benefits, you know, um, what conditions might they help, etc. So that kind of got me into a very interdisciplinary approach to try and optimize um, climate benefits, biodiversity benefits, health benefits, clean water, preventing flooding. What are the ecological lifelines that we all need for all of these different benefits and how can we identify them and get them protected? So I really uh, wrote a very seminal paper a few years ago on proforestation, and it was a collaboration with a climate scientist and um, um, an ecologist basically, and we said, you know, we need to identify um, what are suitable natural areas that we allow all these benefits to occur. So, of course, we need some areas for resources, and we need farms, and we need parks, we need all these different things, but we need a strategic plan to identify the ecological lifelines that we all need. It's almost like, um, you know, how farmers will save their seed corn, right? This intact ecology that gives a full spectrum of species and molecules above and below ground and allows things to move around is like our common treasure and our common seed corn. And you don't eat your seed corn. You don't do experiments on your seed corn unless you're really in bad shape. So um, that's kind of my mission now is to kind of combine all of my values to try and help make a strategic uh, recipe, really. Like how could an area determine what are the key lifelines that they really need. Yeah. And it's so interesting, on, on the surface, it could seem like they're so different, like they're completely unrelated. But like you said, no, they actually are related because the more time you spend in nature, the better it is for your 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 brain health overall. So there is that connection backed by science, yes. which I think is so fascinating. So there really is this connection. even if, But even if you took them individually, they're both so worthwhile to pursue. But when you see that there's a connection between them, it's even well, bigger. Well, and I've seen this escalating in my students, you know, the mental health crisis, which we're all very aware of. And, you know, everyone should have access to a place that they can fall in love with and just know that it'll be there for them. And I feel like it's a real opportunity to reduce, you know, loneliness and all of the kind of um, anxiety and depression that, that people feel be for, for so many different reasons, right? And so to kind of address brain health and prevent mental illness, we really need all the tools in the toolbox. And here's a tool that would help with so many other things at the same time. Yeah. So yeah. that's, I think, the power. 
And that is a great perspective because we talk about ketogenic therapies and that can have such a profound impact, but it doesn't affect everything. It's not going to impact loneliness, <clears throat> excuse me, loneliness yeah. necessarily. And it's not going to do the same as, as if you're out in nature and but by combining those and, and again, tools in the toolkit that you can yeah. use. So that would be my dream to have, you know, I don't know, a place where we could kind of put all these tools together and really help people and and use that as an opportunity to, to educate people about what are these low cost ways that you can curate your own brain health because ultimately we need to get preventative about these problems. Right, do you wanna take the expensive medications with side effects when the problems already happened? or institute the lifestyle and environmental changes that can make it impact now. Yeah, do you wanna spend your time in the doctor's office or spend your time outside? Found, sold, outside. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. If people wanted to find out more about you or learn more about your work, where would you direct them? Uh, you could probably just Google me at Trinity College or Google me on Google Scholar or, or PubMed. My papers are on there. And I actually have a number of my talks on forests and brain health and nature that are also online that people might want to check out. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah.